know the initial energy and you don't need to know the initial energy. You're just asked about the change in the energy. Now, in those cases, our usual formula, energy initial is equal to energy final, except when it's not. That's not the most useful way to write that. If all I care about is the change in the energy, it's better to subtract the initial energy from both sides. And then this becomes Verk is what changes the energy, final minus initial. And in these two problems, 16 and 17, there were only two kinds of buckets, kinetic and gravitational. And so I could rewrite this as Verk external, it either changes the kinetic energy bucket, or it changes the gravitational potential bucket, or it changes both. Okay? Now, in this case, uh, the tension force is pulling up the ramp, and the block is moving up the ramp. If I look at my complicated definition of air, is that positive Eric or negative Eric? Positive. Pulling in the same direction it's going. Positive Eric. So it's going to be positive 55 newtons times 5 meters. I'm looking for the kinetic energy change. Um, anytime that block gets further from the center of the Earth, the the potential energy, the gravitational energy, gets bigger. That's a positive change. If it gets closer to the center of the Earth, that's a negative change. It gets smaller. If your bank account gets smaller, that's a negative change. So in this case, as it goes up the ramp 5 meters, it's also going away from the Earth 3 meters. Well, how did I get that? Well, this is a a 3, 4, 5 triangle. And so that means that my change in potential energy is going to be positive. It's going to be 10 kilograms times G, which is 9.8, call it 10 newtons for each kilogram, times positive 3 meters. And so that gives me 275 joules is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus 300 joules. That gives me a change in kinetic energy of minus 25 joules. Now, some of you, when working this problem, felt insecure about not having the initial kinetic energy. And I talked to some people who wanted to make that zero. Well, let's just assume it starts from rest. Well, you can't do that. Because if I've got a change in kinetic energy that's negative, that means it's slowing down. You can't slow down from rest. You can't get any slower than that. Okay? So this thing had to have been moving initially, and then it slows down as it goes up the ramp. If you start this thing from rest with that tension force, it's going to go downhill, not uphill. Okay? So check that your neighbor got that right, please. <laughs> okay. Let's look at this problem two that was in chapter eight. It turns out that the biggest the biggest difference between momentum and energy is that momentum is a vector. And so with every uh, momentum problem, you're going to need to keep the direction straight. Whether you do that by drawing the vectors or whether you set up a coordinate system and do it with your plus and minus sign, you have to be careful with direction. In this case, we have a ball that is approaching a wall at 15 meters per second. The ball has a mass of 0.2 kilograms. It bounces and leaves the ball, uh, the wall, at 10 meters per second. Now, this is a, a momentum problem, 
And so what I'm going to use here is this impulse momentum equation. Now, just like I did with the energy equation, I can subtract the initial momentum from both sides, and I can write this as uh, impulse is equal to a change in momentum. And that's going to be force average times delta t is equal to the change in momentum. Now, the first thing we're looking for is the change in momentum. Well, if I start with a momentum that's going to the left, that's 3 kilograms times meter per second, let's pause for a moment. We took the unit's Newton meter and we, we honored a, a, a dead professor. We called that a joule. What do we call a kilogram meter per second? It's never been named. So we're going to name it the Francis. I've got enough students that I figure this is going to catch on. If all of you just stick with this story, uh, I'm going to be famous. Uh, plural, of course, is Franci. So I've got three Franci to the left, and afterwards I have two Franci to the right. Well, the difference between three and two is not one, because it's not really three and two. It's three to the left, it's two to the right. And the difference there is five. The change or difference is what I have to add, there's the plus sign, to this initial momentum to bring that momentum all the way back to zero and out the other side. Okay? Now, if we wanted to do that with mathematics, <laughs> we would set up a coordinate system where if we call the right positive x and the left negative x, well then our change in momentum would be final minus initial. And in this coordinate system, my final momentum is after the bounce. And that's going to be to the right or the positive x direction, plus 2 franci. And then I subtract off the initial momentum, which is to the left, so it would be a negative 3 franci. And the minus minus is adding, so that's going to be a positive 5 franci. Now I can find the average force just by dividing that change in momentum by the time that was involved, the 0.02 seconds. And what I'm going to get is 250 newtons, and it's a positive 250 newtons in that coordinate system, meaning it's to the right. And that's what you'd expect the wall to do, is push to the right on the wall. Are there questions about that problem? Okay. I have a handout. Um, here's the thing. This handout is trivial. It's almost like a Rorschach test. You're going to be able to do this in your head. And I've been tempted every semester to just not do it. But it turns out that the, the message in this page is one of the most important messages before the next exam. Um, People that don't understand this page are going to have a hard time on the exam. <laughs> now, I didn't want to waste paper, so I put uh, special problem 14 on the back. That's not due until a Monday after uh, Easter, so uh, just don't lose the piece of paper. I'll also post it to DQL. Uh, I was raised by thrifty kid parents. You got one? Now, 
In this problem, we shoot an arrow into a haystack and it travels one meter in a tenth of a second and stops. Uh, then we take a second arrow, actually it's the same arrow, but we fire it again, this time twice as fast. Now, let's be clear. Greg's a city boy. I was raised in a bunch of cities. We moved around a lot, but we always lived in the city. Those of you that grew up on a ranch or a farm know that, that the deeper you go into a haystack, the more it's going to resist the motion. But this is city hay, okay? This is city hay, and the friction force is going to be the same no matter how deep that, that arrow goes into the haystack. It, it's city hay. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Okay, so really quick, see if you can solve all of those questions. Think of it as a roar shock. and it went really quick. If you haven't, you're still struggling. Let's work that together. Part A asks us how much more kinetic energy does the fast arrow have than the slow arrow? Well, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, which we can write as one half mv times v. Now, if I shoot the same arrow the second time, then the mass is going to be the same. But it's going twice as fast, we're told, so this gets twice as big, and so does this. And that means that the kinetic energy gets four times as big, because the speed is squared. So my kinetic energy initial for the fast arrow is going to be four times the kinetic energy initial for the slow arrow. Now, on B, it asks us how much more momentum would the faster arrow have? Well, momentum is linearly related to velocity. Again, it's the same arrow, so the same mass. But the speed doubles, and so that means that the momentum doubles, and that means that the momentum initial for the fast arrow 
is twice as big as the momentum for the slope. Slope, spelled without an N. Now, here's the point of this page. When you get to that midterm, every problem is going to be either energy or momentum. But if you try to use momentum to solve an energy problem, you're going to get zero points. There's just nothing we can do for you. If you try to use energy to solve a momentum problem, you're going to get zero points. So in each problem, you've got to ask yourself, is this energy or is this momentum? And making the right decision is critical. Now this page teaches you how to make that right decision. Part C here asks, how much time is required to stop the faster arrow? If we are looking for time, or if you're given time and expected to use it, is that energy or momentum? It's got to be momentum. You never learn anything about energy from time, or anything about time from energy. Uh, they're exclusive, okay? So anytime you're dealing with time, it's a momentum problem. So let's use the grand high impulse momentum equation. This is part C. The momentum initial is equal to the momentum final, except when it's not, when there's a force acting for a time. Now the initial momentum, we said, was the mass of the arrow times its initial velocity. And since this is a vector equation, we need a coordinate system. Let's call for the right positive and to the left negative. Since the arrow is traveling to the right, this would be positive momentum. Now when the arrow stops, the momentum is zero, because the velocity is zero. Now the force that is changing this momentum is the friction that is acting by the hay on the arrow. Now because that friction force is pushing on the arrow to the left, that would be a negative force. That would be the kinetic friction by the hay on the arrow, times the time. Now, the mass stays the same because it's the same arrow. The speed doubles. That means the positive part of this equation gets bigger by a factor of two. In order for this to still be zero, the negative part of this equation must be, get bigger by a factor of two. Because we're dealing with city hay, the friction force always stays the same. Doesn't matter how fast the arrow's going or how deep it is in the haystack. And that means that the time has to double. So that means that the time for the fast arrow is going to be twice the time for the slow arrow. The time for the slow arrow was 0.1 seconds, so this is going to be 0.2 seconds. D. How far does the faster arrow go? Now again, just like any time you have time, it's a momentum problem. Any time you have distance, it's going to be an energy problem. You never learn anything about distance using momentum. It's got to be energy. Force times distance is the vert that changes energy. So let's use energy. And in this problem, there's no springs. If the arrow is shot horizontally, we call that height zero. There's no gravitational energy. The only kind of energy we're talking about is kinetic. So initially, I have 1 half mv squared. I'm going to call it v times v. When the arrow stops, I have zero kinetic energy. And those are different because there's negative verk done by the friction force. Now, why is that verk negative? It has nothing to do with the force being in the negative direction. Energy is a scalar, it's not a vector. 
The important thing is the force is acting one way and the arrow is going the opposite way. And it doesn't matter what those ways are, if they're opposite, that's negative error. So I put negative force, the friction force, by the hay on the arrow times the distance. We play the same game. It's the same arrow, so the same mass. The speed doubles here and here. So that means the kinetic energy gets four times bigger. In order for this to stay zero, the negative part of the equation must also get four times bigger. Since the friction force stays the same, that means the distance has to get four times bigger and the distance traveled for the fast arrow will be four times the distance for the slow. Since the slow went one meter, this would go four meters. Now the last part of this page asks, is that consistent? This arrow went four times as far in only twice the time. And the answer is yes, that's consistent. Let's say you and I are going on a road trip in different cars. I go 30 miles an hour because I'm old. You go 60 miles an hour because you're young. I only drive for four hours during the day because I'm old. You drive for twice that amount of time, eight hours, because you're young. How much further down the road are you going to get than me? Four times. Twice as far because you're going twice as fast, and twice as far because you're going twice as many hours. So yes, it's consistent. Check that your neighbor understands the message of this simple page so that they'll do well on the exam. Okay, let's get to rocket science. Suppose I have a collision where a truck hits a Volvo, or maybe I could say a Volvo hits a truck, and uh, during that collision, if I were to ask you to find the total impulse for the truck Volvo system, well, impulse is a force times a time. And if I want the impulse on the system of the truck and the Volvo, I would have to find the impulse on the truck as a vector, and the impulse on the Volvo as a vector, and add those together. Well, forces require three body diagrams. The truck and the Volvo have weight down and normal up, and then I have a normal force by the Volvo on the truck during the collision, and a much bigger force by the truck on the Volvo because the Volvo has more mass. Because the Volvo was uh, the... Did I say the Volvo has more mass? That's not right. The truck has more mass. So is that okay? The truck was speeding. The truck was speeding and has more mass. No? No. They have to be exactly the same by what law? by third law. And folks, that is the very foundation of rocket science, Newton's third law. Without Newton's third law, we don't have conservation of momentum. And that's what rocket science is built on. Okay? Watch how it happens. The impulse on the truck is just the net force on the truck times the time during which it experiences that force. The impulse on the Volvo is just the net force on the Volvo times the time that it experiences that force. Now I think we can agree that if this collision lasts a tenth of a second for the truck, it also lasted a tenth of a second for the Volvo, so we can get rid of those indices. Now here's the thing. This vector is the same as that vector, only in the opposite direction. And so when I add these together, I always get zero. Now, impulse is what changes momentum. 
if my system has no impulse, what does that tell me about the change in momentum for that system? It doesn't change. And that's what we mean when we say it is conserved. It is conserved. Here's my promise to you. If you will always, always, always include everything that collides or hits or pounds or touches or pushes, anything that interacts in your system, if you do that, then all of the forces will come as equal and opposite pairs by Newton's third law. The impulse on that system will be zero. If the impulse is zero, that means rather than going to the general equation, you can go here. Whereby P initial equals P final, I mean the momentum of the system initial equals the momentum of the system final. Now there's a caveat that's important. When you were dealing with energy, you got to choose what you meant by initial. You got to choose what you meant by final. They could be any time during the day. But when you are using momentum on a collision, you don't have that freedom. Initial means right before the collision. Final means right after the collision. You can't wait for those cars to slide across the pavement and into someone's garden. It's right after the collision. Right after. Now, that is always, always, always conserved. In every single collision, momentum is always conserved. Even if that collision involves C4. No matter how messy the collision is, it will always, always be conserved. Now, let's look at a sample collision. I have two identical volts, each 1,200 kilograms, and they're each going 30 meters per second, which is over 60 miles an hour. One's going left and one's going right. If I were to ask you to find the total kinetic energy for that system, could you do it? Get your calculator out. And give me a number. Give me a number. And once you get a number, tell me what it is. They're both going 30 meters per second, one going left and one going right. The total kinetic energy for the system of both cars Okay, get your uh, vote in. Whoa, zero's the winner. And that's because we got a bunch of right going energy, we got a bunch of left going energy, and the right going energy cancels the left going energy. Is that right? No. No, energy doesn't have direction. There's no such thing as right going energy or left going energy. There's just energy. You got something, you don't got something. It's like money. You got it. You got money, I got money, let's get married. You know, if you got money and I get married, to you, we just have the money. Okay? Now, let's do that with energy. Okay? I take the energy of the left car and the energy of the right car. I use kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Notice that I put a minus sign here to indicate that this car was going to the left. But in doing so, I just wasted, well, I won't say faux pas, but I wasted shadow. I wasted darkness there. Why? Because we're going to square it. It doesn't matter that it's negative. Uh, I'm going to square it. So I got a half billion joules in the left car. I got a half billion joules in the right car. I got a million and change. I got a million and change. 
Now that's a lot of energy. Energy is the capacity to do damage. And two Volvos going 60 miles an hour can do a lot of damage. Now, how much energy is that compared to electric energy? Well, that would be the amount of energy that it would take to light a 100 watt bulb for about three hours. And you would need to pay about four cents for that, okay? Four cents. So electrical energy is cheap. Now don't leave the lights on, just to be leaving the lights on, but uh, it's pretty, pretty cheap. Actually, I got to <laughs> 23 years ago when I came to this valley, I was still invited to party. Uh, that's, that's ended. Um, so we were invited to this party by this rich, uh, uh, it was a doctor in town, and uh, as the evening went on, this doctor was just ragging on his wife. He was just ragging on how she could just, she was just always spending money, and just always spending money. And finally, he was talking about how she was just always wasting electricity. And he said he went on this hunting trip, and when he came home, every light in the mansion was on. And then to beat the band, she came out to greet him and turned on the porch light too. And by then I'd had enough, and I said, you know what? If she leaves all those lights on all month long, you're going to pay $85 extra. I took my daughter to you to have a wart burned off her toe, and you charged me $150. If you want to save money, stop going to the doctor. I've never been invited back. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's an exception to that. If you turn on an electric dryer and go out and look at your little meter outside, it's just going crazy. So if you've got an electric dryer, just shoot it in the head, okay? <laughs> now, let's talk about momentum. What's the total momentum of that system? Shout it out. Zero, because that's a vector, and vectors care about direction. So now I do have left-going momentum and right-going momentum. When I put in this minus sign, it does matter, because now it's not being squared. And so when I add up all the momentum, I get zero. Now, I promised you, if you include both of those cars that are colliding in your system, that momentum has to be conserved. It has to stay the same. So after the collision, what's got to happen? How am I going to have total momentum equal to zero after that collision? Yeah, they got to stop. Is there any other way it can have momentum zero after the collision? They're going in the opposite direction. What about that? Would that be zero? Yeah. Or anything in between. Now, when I tell you momentum's always conserved during a collision, that sounds really, really great. But it doesn't, doesn't narrow things down as much as you would like. It turns out that there's an infinite number of ways to conserve momentum here. I can conserve momentum by stopping and locking bumpers, or I can have them move away just as fast as they were coming in, or anything in between. Now let's look at the energy, the mechanical energy. In this case, mechanical energy means kinetic energy, because we're assuming a level road. <coughs> I start with a million and change in joules, and if the car stop, that's gone. If I look at this case, I've still got the million and change, and there I've lost most of it. Now, the question is, where does that energy go here and here? Now to answer that, let me ask you a different question. You're on the corner and you observe this collision. The police come to talk to you and they say, whoa, what was it like? Tell me about it. What did you hear? What did it sound like? It came in, what did it? Make the sound. <laughs> sound is energy. If you didn't lose any mechanical energy, you didn't hear it. This came in and out. 
How do you make that happen? How do you make that happen? Brave soul, raise your hand. Come on, rise to the occasion. You can do it. Don't be a coward. Yes, sir. A perfectly incompressible material. That gets really, really close. That's as close as I've ever heard someone suggest. And that's still going to make a tink that we would hear. That's really close. Though. What else? Anyone? Put it in the magical world, the frictionless surfaces exist. The magical world! Yeah. <laughs> the basement of the physics building. It turns out that just being frictionless isn't going to solve this problem. These guys could be sliding on frictionless ice and uh, they could still collide and lose all your kinetic energy. What if we mounted magnets, huge magnets on the front of your car, North Pole against the North Pole, and they came in and never touched? Would that work? That would work. Now here's my point. This kind of collision is very hard to engineer. It happens once in a blue moon. Usually, usually, by which I mean almost every stinking time, we lose mechanical energy. So you're taking that next exam, you turn the page, and it's a collision problem. You've got that decision that you always have. Is this energy or is this momentum? Well, if energy, mechanical energy, is conserved once every blue moon, and you don't know whether this is that blue moon, I wouldn't go with energy. In fact, my, my advice to you is that every single collision problem, you should solve with momentum. Would you write that down? Every single collision problem, you should solve with momentum. Now, once every blue moon, you might get the right answer using energy because it might be one of those special cases where energy was conserved, but that doesn't happen very often, and certainly not in my class. Okay? Now, where does the energy go in these other two cases? Where does it get lost to? Raise your hand. Yes? Heat. Heat. If you touch those bubblers, they'll be, they'll be hot. We already talked about sound. You can hear the crash going on. What else? The crumple. the crumple. That's where most of it goes. Most of it goes into taking that Volvo and just messing it up. Just taking the frame and twisting it and crumpling it and smashing it together. Watch the slide. Watch the slide. One, two, three. Pow! <laughs> We call that energy of deformation. And we do not have an equation for that. Not just we in this class, we in the universe. The energy of deformation for a Volvo is just too messy. No one has an equation for that. Now, the energy, the total energy, is conserved during that collision, but not the mechanical energy, not the kind of energy that we've got formulas for. And so we can't use our energy equation to solve these problems. Now we put these collisions into three categories. If the mechanical energy is conserved once every blue moon, we call it an elastic collision. If that mechanical energy is not conserved, we call it inelastic. And in the special case where the bumpers lock together, and it becomes one Volvo with eight wheels, we call it maximally inelastic. Those are the three types of collision. Now you're gonna be you're gonna to have to be able to look at collisions and determine which flavor it is: elastic, inelastic, or maximally inelastic. Now I have some surfaces here. I have a rubber surface, I have a steel surface, and I have a glass surface. I also have three balls. I've got a rubber ball, 
a metal steely, and a glass marble. And I'm going to bounce rubber on rubber, steel on steel, glass on glass, and I want you to predict which will be most elastic. Now, before we start, how would you recognize an elastic collision? If I were to drop it from this height, what would happen in a perfectly elastic collision? It go right back up to the same height. So, with your clicker, tell me which is going to be the most elastic. Okay, last call. Okay, rubber on rubber. Okay, let's do it. Whoa. Whoa. Wait a minute. I tricked you. <laughs> Turns out years ago, uh, one of my colleagues spent some of your tuition money on this set of balls that were in an educational supply catalog and they're called the happy ball and the sad ball and you can tell which one's a happy ball and which one's a sad ball. I was messing with you. <laughs> okay, here's the happy ball. Oh, that's still not so... Okay, here's the metal on metal. Even less. Here's the glass on glass. Whoa. That's the most elastic. And the point of this demo is that we use the word elastic in physics to mean something completely different than we use in the word for in everyday life. In everyday life, we use the word elastic to mean malleable, bendable, and, like a rubber band. But elastic in physics talk means we don't lose the energy. And when you, when you have something that can compress, that can change shape, that's rubbery, well then you have that energy of deformation. You lose some of your mechanical energy. This glass on glass was the most elastic collision precisely because it doesn't deform. Because the glass is very rigid. And so none of the energy goes into energy of deformation. Now, let's look at a different collision. In this case, one of the Volvos is parked. It's not moving. The other Volvo is going at the 60 miles an hour, 30 meters per second, and rams into it. And in the process, locks bumpers such that the two are moving together. Now, right after the collision, how fast are they going? Now, don't wait for them to scrape across the nose. Right after the collision, how fast are they going? Tell your neighbor. How fast? Thank you. In the interest of time, let's do this together. P initial equals P final. Before the collision, I have 1,200 kilograms moving at 30 meters per second to the right, so it's positive. I also have 1,200 kilograms not moving at all. I just wasted ink. Afterwards, I have the two moving together, so that's 2,400 kilograms moving at some V final. That V final has to be 15 meters per second. I doubled the amount of mass that was moving. I have to cut the velocity in half. Now folks, is the final kinetic energy zero? With your clicker one more time, what flavor, what flavor of collision would this be? Okay, I got gotcha. you. 
The answer is C, maximally elastic. Now here, folks, I know you want to go out your weekend. I got 30 seconds. Maximally elastic is when they lock bumper, period. They can still be moving. Maximally elastic doesn't mean they have to lose all the kinetic energy. They just have to lose the most that's allowed by law. Newton's third law does not allow these cars to be stopped after this collision. It would violate Newton's third law. So maximally elastic just means lose the most. And that always happens when they lock bumpers. Have a great weekend, people. We'll see you on Monday.